Hello everyone, Grzegorz Baran here. In version 1.6, Agisoft has introduced a new photogrammetry reconstruction mode. In this video, I decided to give it a try and share the results with you. So, this time I'm going to present full photogrammetry workflow where I captured a cliff rock formation and turned it into a vista prop. In details, I'm going to show cliff rock formation capture with the drone, an image post processing with different way for ambient shadow removal in Photolab 3, a full 3D reconstruction in Metashape using new reconstruction mode, I will build a low poly model in ZBrush, which I'm going to UV map with the Rizom UV. I will bake textures using Substance Designer. Next, I'm going to fix missing areas in Substance Painter. And finally, I'm going to compose a quick scene in Marmoset Toolbag 3 to present the result. I hope someone finds this video interesting and fun to watch. And let's begin. The new reconstruction mode was introduced in version 1.6 of Metashape. This mode is way faster and way less resource demanding for reconstruction when compared with other modes as well as previous Metashape versions. Bear in mind that new mode works in arbitrary reconstruction mode with depth maps selected as a source only. The high field mode but also the arbitrary, but based on a dense cloud as a source of data, work as before and have no out-of-core implementation and no GPU support. This new method can benefit from additional amount of RAM available and also fast communication with the project folder as quite a lot of intermediate data is stored in the project folder and being read and rewritten. So using fast SSD drive to store the project file should give faster reconstruction and likely outperform slow hard disk drive. We should also get them significantly faster when we compare reconstruction times before the 1.6 version. And last but not least, bear in mind that the current depth map based reconstruction mode gives a bit lower density mesh to the one based on the dense cloud. Fortunately, these are things Agisoft is currently working on, so should be fixed soon. Let's move to the capture part then. For this capture, I picked pretty cloudy but windy day. The sun was shining through clouds from time to time, but it was fine seems material capture wasn't my top priority this time. I wanted to find and capture larger but consistent rock formation, which can be used as a quite generic and universal vista prop. The low tide gave better access to interesting rock formations and exposed bottom parts of the rocks, but I had to be careful since the high tide was coming and without paying attention I could end up in the water. It took me a while to get to the nice spot, but finally I have found a really nice cliff wall with interesting shape. Since I was planning to capture it and turn it into a vista prop, my aim was to get a full image coverage from every possible angle. The only fast and easy way to capture this type of prop is to use a drone. Without a drone I wouldn't have access to big parts of this cliff. Since the ground wasn't flat, I decided for a hand takeoff. For this capture, I set the drone's camera f-stop to 4, but I left ISO in auto mode. Hopefully light was good enough and all images were captured with the ISO 100. This is the setting I have found the most optimal for Mavic 2 Pro and close surface scanning. It gives short exposure time, while this value is small enough to compensate the distance to some degree and give sharp images also on image edges. Before I started the scan, I took a few images of color checker for future white balance correction and color calibration. Unfortunately, since this cliff is quite huge and has limited access, I didn't set up any rulers as a scale reference. Scanning takes some time, especially for larger props. It is quite easy to get lost and leave some areas uncovered and at the same time overshooting others. 
This is why it is worth to keep scanning path organized. And this is the path I have found the most efficient and useful when I scan larger vertical props with the drone. I simply fly in vertical lines trying to keep the same distance to the subject. So I fly up taking series of pictures until there is nothing more to capture and when done I move the drone to the next virtual column and fly down taking another series of images. When done I repeat these steps over and over until everything is covered. And this is exactly what I have done in here. To make sure I didn't miss anything, I also took a few shots from larger distance, as even lower quality data is better to no data. There were a few birds flying around and a few crazy seagulls, but I have learned that seagulls need more space to attack. They are predators, but they usually dive from the top to hit the target to pull up when it is done. It works with fishes in the open sea, but not in this case, since the cliff wall limits the space. So, as long as I kept the drone quite close to the cliff wall, it was safe and seagulls were just flying around in big circles. I'm not saying that these seagulls wanted to attack the drone, just that it would be quite hard for them if they would try. Finally, I managed to capture 274 key images plus a few additional for color calibration. All captured images were fine. When the capture was over, I hand landed the drone and packed it back to my backpack. The next step is the image photo editing to get the best from all captured images. For photo editing I use a Photolab 3. Next let's jump into Customize section and select the image which is going to be used to set up the white balance. With this image selected let's press Ctrl and A to select all images. Next let's zoom in to see the color checker clips and select neutral clip with the white balance color picker. It sets the white balance based on this value to all selected images. Next, let's remove some ambient occlusion shadows using selective tone section. Since we work on raw image, we work on very dense color data and it is totally fine to shift colors and push values because while working on RAW, we deal with way more additional data that we really need. So even if we limit the histogram area, we still have a lot of real capture-based data to pick from. Just to remind you one of my previous videos, this is the histogram-based chart showing how many colors, depending on their color depth RAW files, can store. It means that as long as we operate on dense 14 bits row data, we can consider any color shifts within a dynamic range lossless. And this is the stage where we can easily remove any ambient occlusion shadows or column down highlights by simply playing with options in selective tone section. It would affect their construction quality if we would use 8 bits for reconstruction but as long we export the result into 16 bits and use that 16 bits results for reconstruction, photogrammetry software gets more data to what it even needs. It is good to understand that the photogrammetry reconstruction isn't based on shadows, but positions of points, as long photogrammetry software has enough information to see the difference between neighbor pixels and while we work on 16 bits it definitely has, we should be totally fine. We should also turn the crop collection off as we don't want Photolab to remove anything from our images. Also we should turn any geometry distortion correction off as the photogrammetry software will do it way better. And I think we should be ready to export the data for reconstruction. 
We just need to make sure we export in format which supports 16 bits like TIFF or PNG. I usually use TIFF. Since we convert 275 images this way, it's going to take a while. When done, we can jump into Metashape and upload those images for reconstruction. The next step is the reconstruction. First, to reconstruct the subject, we need to load and align all the images in 3D space. I did it by selecting workload and images. I skipped the image with myself holding the color checker and selected the first image with actual rock formation. Next, I moved to the last one and with shift pressed, I selected it with all between. Next, we need to align those images in 3D space. I did it by jumping into workflow and select align images. Let's try it with the default setting. Since we work on 16 bits images, it should be enough. But in case not all images are aligned, we can play with numbers in advanced setting and increase values. Depends on alignment setting, this process can take from a couple of minutes to even a few hours. This alignment took about 2 hours, so let's skip this video to the moment when it was over. When the alignment is done, all images should have a thick. This marking means that the image was aligned and it's going to be used for reconstruction. With all images aligned, we are sure that we are going to use all collected data we have for reconstruction. After image alignment, we can see the camera positions and tie points. These points are a naviga navigational points shared between cameras to estimate the positioning in 3D space for the reconstruction. Blue planes are representing the camera position from the moment when the image was taken. Looks like this rock formation is quite well covered from close and medium distance and it should be enough information for reconstruction. The box around the tie points limits the reconstruction area. Let's extend it a bit to cover skipped part to the right side. I think everything looks ok, so let's move with the next step, which is the reconstruction. As you can see, we get more options after the images were aligned. Since we want to proceed with a full 3D reconstruction, let's use the reconstruction mode I mentioned at the beginning of this video. To do this, we need to select workflow from the top tab and pick option to generate mesh. As I mentioned, the new mode works only with the depth maps used as a source of data and only in the arbitrary 3D mode. To get mesh as dense as possible, let's keep the quality as ultra high and maximum face count. Since I want color to be stored in vertexes, let's make sure that option to calculate vertex color is active. Next, let's hit the OK button and start the reconstruction. Next, let's speed time a bit since full 3D reconstruction took almost 22 hours. In previous version of Metashape it would probably take even more and highly likely crash at the end giving totally nothing back. As you can see, mesh we generated has 56 million faces and is quite accurate. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to cover everything and there are a few gaps left. 
These gaps can be easily covered with the low poly model and filled with texture data using clone tool in Substance Painter in next stage. But before that, let's save the model and export it as a high poly source for baking. Exporting 60 million polydense FBX file might take even an hour. This one took 40 minutes. Since it is very hard to navigate in ZBrush with such a heavy mesh, we need to decimate it in Metashape to create a lighter version. We can do it easily by running a decimate tool from Tools and Mesh tab. I think that 5 million polygons should be enough to keep all the shape details we might need in the next step, so let's set decimation to 5 millions and press the OK. Or no, let's pick 10 millions as ZBrush also should handle 10 millions without any problems. Just be careful and don't save any changes after the summation is done, so we will keep the heavy model in a project to be able to redecimate it to whatever value we need. As you can see, 10 millions is enough to store all these shape details, so it's definitely enough as a reference to build a low poly model in ZBrush. The summation itself is quite fast and when finished we can export the summated mesh as another FBX file. Exporting 10 million poly took me just 3 minutes. When done, we can close Metashape, just without saving to do not override the high poly with its decimated version. Now since we have a high poly model for baking and medium poly model as re a reference, we need to build a fully functional low poly version of it and bake all high poly information into its texture. So let's jump into ZBrush and load our 10 million faces dense model as a reference to build a low poly one. Next, let's bring the topology brush and create the low poly model using the detailed model as our reference. The topology brush is a very handy and efficient tool for this job. Next, let's set the proper spline accuracy using draw distance slider. And let's start building the model. With the topology brush, we simply draw lines. When they cross to each other, they create the connection point. So, we don't need to be very accurate drawing these lines. What really matters are just the intersections. Areas defined by 3 or 4 connection points are being filled with a face. Because we are going to project this low poly model on our heavy reference, we don't need to be very accurate. We just need to focus on main topology to follow the main shape. This way we will get enough geometry to wrap around details after we subdivide the mesh. Thank you. 
When done, we need to separate low poly mesh from the reference and project it on the, its surface to make sure it aligns properly. To get a bit more information from geometry itself, let's divide it a bit and project it on the 10 million polydense mesh. And let's repeat that until we get the density we want. I think on 5th subdivision the mesh is dense enough to carry all silhouette details. For the vista prop seen from long distance, first or the second subdivision level would be totally enough. But since this is a vista prop for a steel shot in Marmoset toolbox scene, I can go a bit crazier and not worry about performance too much. Just bear in mind that in workflow totally nothing changes and no matter what mesh density I pick, next steps are exactly the same. If it would be the game asset, I would go with way lower density. Now the mesh is ready to be exported. To make the final scene a bit more interesting, let's create something for the ground surface and export it out. Now it's time to UV map it. UV mapping can be done directly in ZBrush with UV master tool, but there is a way better tool designed just for this and this is the tool I'm going to use. So for UV mapping, let's jump into Rhizome UV. To start UV mapping in Rhizome UV, we need to drag and drop the mesh we have made. We can UV map it manually, half manually, or totally trust the Rhizom UV and let it do the job for us. Since we are going to use a dedicated texture without any overlapping, with information baked directly from the high poly model, let's save some time and let Rhizom UV to do the full job. Let's move into Auto Seams and Full Auto UV Stab. Next, select Auto Select Mosaic Mode. And next, let's select Free for number of cuts. This one means less distortion but more cuts. 
Next, let's activate overlaps and stretching detection, as it's important for us to do not have anything baked in the same space twice. And let's proceed with UV mapping. Auto select edges button selects the UVs for cutting following the rules we set. We can change the rules, recalculate them or hit the second button if we are ok with what we see. The next button cuts and flattens the UV shells. When done, it's time to hit the last button which will rescale and pack all these UV islands within a single UDIM and will use as much space as possible. Now it's time to hit Ctrl and S to save our UV mapping to the FBX file and consider UV mapping process as done. Now it's time to bake all color and high information from the high poly model to the low poly one we made. To do this, let's jump into Substance Designer and use its baker. When opened, let's create any substance. It doesn't matter which since we need just to run the baker. Next, let's bring the low poly model we want to use for baking and activate the baker on it. Let's configure the baker window and start the baking process. Looks like I missed the vertex color as a source for color map, so let's fix it and rebake just the color map. Now looks like we have full set of textures to deal with, so it's time to jump into the painter and fix what's left to be fixed. Since we didn't bake a roughness map, Let's generate one in Substance Designer using our bakes. I quickly made one by processing albedo with the high pass filter. Next, I multiply the value with ambient occlusion map since we don't want nothing what is hidden in a shadow to be reflective. And at the end, since it's a roughness map, I inverted all values. Now it's time to jump into Painter for final tweaks. Let's bring our UV map low poly rock formation. Next, let's add a fill layer and fill the channels with baked textures. First, we need to import them to the project and add to, to the channels.
To be able to use clone tool, we need to apply paint to the layer and set it to pass through for every channel. With paint active, we can activate the clone tool and paint on the mesh. By pressing V, we select the area where we want to clone from. Now we need to find areas to fix and overpaint them with correct data. It is worth to switch between channels to get better visibility. It can be done by pressing C button. With M, we come back to material view. Looks like I missed the ambient occlusion map, so let's bring it in then. Ok, looks like everything is done. Now we can export all the textures and apply them in the next step to our render scene in Marmoset Toolbag. Let's open the Marmoset Toolbag then and put all elements together. At the beginning let's bring our main hero, the rock formation, to the scene. Next, let's apply all the textures we made. Since this rock formation looks crap without the context, let's add the context then and bring both ground meshes we made before to the scene. This one will be used as a solid ground. Next, let's bring another one and try to set it as a background water plane. Since this is not the subject of this video, to cover the ground planes I will just bring two environment materials I already made. For this beach I'm gonna pick the one I captured a while ago. For the water I will use a procedural water material I made ages ago too. This one isn't the best but should do the job. Next let's drag both materials to meshes and set up the tiling to the value which makes sense. Next, let's copy the cliff and set it in a longer distance and rearrange the scene to build nice and interesting composition.
To make lighting a bit more interesting, let's apply one of my sky maps I captured a while ago. Let's add additional light, which will cast a sharp shadow by tapping on HDRI preview map and adjust the angle and brightness. Next, let's add some fog and set up the render. And finally, let's bring some life to the scene. Let's do a bit more tweaking until we are happy with what we see and I guess we can consider the scene done. I really hope you found something useful in this video. If you found it interesting and want me to create more content like this one, please drop the comment, leave the thumbs up and if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Big thanks to those who did it already, as it really motivates and helps me to move forward and create more content I can share with you. I guess that's it and hopefully see you in the next video. Bye!